So this Sunday, uh, we're talking, we're, we're looking at the vision of our church again to, to remind ourselves, or maybe if you haven't been coming long, maybe this is kind of the first time outside of the website, or maybe uh, talking to some friends uh, to find out about what Citizens Church is all about. And often, we'll go through experiences as a family, and sometimes my kids will even look at me and they'll say, that's going to be a story in a sermon, isn't it? You know, because they're just like used to that happening. And that happened once uh, this summer, actually, when we were, uh, we were out camping in Quebec, and we were at this place where you actually, you had to... Um, carry all of your stuff to the cottage that you were staying at. It was kind of like an off-grid kind of a thing. And so we were lugging all of our stuff, and I was pulling the little cart with the cooler loaded because you have to bring all your food for the five days. It was, it was all heavy and stuff. And then we came to this one point, and I was at the front. I'll take ownership of this. I was at the front, and it, the path went to the left, to the center, and to the right. <laughs> and, and I was like, oh, man. That doesn't look like the right option. This one didn't look like the right one either. So I was like, let's go up this one. That's the only one that's the upward incline, okay? So I was like, let's go that way. So we carted it up that way. Actually, as I was going up, I was so like head into just like going that the cooler fell right out of the thing that I was, the wagon that I was pulling on. Thankfully, nothing fell out. But we ended up getting to the cottage, but it was the wrong choice, okay? The right choice actually would have been to go straight. Um, no clear signage. I'll blame it on that, okay? No clear signage. But it was one of those moments where it was just easy to get lost and lose your way, even though we got to the destination, okay? I could look back and tell everybody, hey, the journey was difficult, but we made it here, okay? We got here. But everybody was like, no. We took a wrong turn, okay, and this is the wrong direction, and, and they were right. It's easy to lose our way, isn't it? It's easy to kind of get lost or to take a wrong turn. And even for us as a church, um, only like a year and a half into it, there's no doubt been things that have pulled us off track of our, of our vision. Whether it was things that were out of our control, obviously like the pandemic, that was totally out of our control. It wasn't in our list of things that we wanted, you know. Or whether it's been things that we um, slowly uh, drifted into or away from. Or maybe it's choices that we've actually made. Like just blatant choices where we're like, you know what, the vision sounded great on paper. But now that it's right square in front of my face, I'm not sure if I actually like it that much. So this morning, I don't know where you're at in that process. Brand new to the vision or maybe just like me, we've been on the road here now for, I, actually, I, I don't know why I do this, but sometimes I, I type into Google, how many days have I, blah, blah, blah. Well, we've been doing this church plant for 504 days, okay? So of 504 days along here, where have we drifted off the path? And we're going to look this morning at um, 1 Peter, okay? So if you have a Bible, turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter is a church that's also lost its way. Now, not for the same reasons as us, and I don't even think for reasons that were like choices to step away from the vision, possibly, but the basic reason that Peter is writing these believers in Asia Minor is persecution is coming heavy on them. They are struggling under it. And so Peter is trying to remind them, to teach them, to encourage them, to admonish them, whatever word you want to use, to bring them back to the clarity of vision that they have before them. And it's a text, actually, that is very helpful for us because we've said this multiple times. At Citizens, we have not really created anything new. If anything, we've taken old ideas from, like, church, like, in the last 30 or 40 years and old ideas that come straight out of, like, early church history. And so when we look at this text this morning, we're going to see some themes, specifically four of them, that stand out from the text, but also stand out in terms of our vision of a church and where we want to go together. So let's read these verses together. 1 Peter chapter 2, starting in verse 4. In verse 4 it says this, As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves like living stones are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, 
to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word, as they were destined to do. Verse 9 says this, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Peter begins by bringing the focus to the gospel. In the first couple verses there that I just read, Peter is trying to point them to this new foundation stone. He's using this imagery, right, of like a building, a temple maybe comes to their mind. Maybe if they're Jews that have been to Jerusalem, the temple mount is coming to mind for them. And he's saying, like a building has this key um, foundation stone that everything else is built off of, so we now as believers have this one center piece, this cornerstone that everything is built out of. And everything comes from that. But he's using that imagery to get us to think actually about Jesus. And so he says, this this stone, and he quotes from the Old Testament, is not just a stone, it's actually a living stone. It actually has like some power to it. So he says, this gospel message that we have believed in, which is Jesus Christ, he's this cornerstone, and he is this living, active, breathing power that is within every believer. So it's not just something that we enter into as, you know, new believers and we're saved and we're kind of, we're on the good team now. And so the rest of our lives, we're just on the good team and we just got to do the best that we can to stay on that team. Otherwise, you know, we don't want to get benched or we don't want to get booted off that team. Peter's saying the gospel is that Jesus is actually this living being who can who can transform people's lives, and he can actually, he's active and he's moving. And so, I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, I was mainly worried about just getting to heaven, right? The idea of going to, you know, a lake of fire was not a good idea in my book. So I was like, I just need to get into heaven, and then, like, all is good. And when I was a kid, I would often see, like, what do you call them, like these sunbeams, you know, when the cloud is kind of, and you see the sunbeam, and I was like, it's like a stairway leading to heaven. It's a sunbeam, and that's where I'm going someday. That was like all that was like on my mind. It was just this driving force of like, I need to get to heaven, and that's the only thing that the gospel really is. Peter is reminding them here, he's saying this building that God is building of of people, of people changed by the gospel, is a, it's a living organism. It's actually something that is happening in our lives. So it's not just a future destination, although that is a reality of it. It's also something that is real here in your life. It's living. It's active. It's the person of Jesus, the power of the gospel. So it's the difference between religion, which just says, you know, kind of buckle down and do everything right, and you'll get to that celestial place someday. You'll get to heaven Versus the gospel saying, your life can be changed here and now. Jesus is living and active. And so it takes forms in many different ways. I put this little chart up here just to kind of show some, and I'm not going to read these all because it'll just take too long. Essentially, the bottom one is the one that's the most important, right? The difference between religion and kind of organized church together, which says, like, I obey, therefore I'm accepted. That's like the religious kind of mindset. Whereas the gospel says, I am accepted. 
Now, the gospel doesn't deny that I'm probably more sinful and more broken than I would ever acknowledge. But it also says that despite that, because of what Christ has done for us, because he's died, buried, and resurrected, he's still alive, I'm like more fully accepted than I could ever dream possible. And so this aspect of the gospel is actually the power that you can see these couple of examples here. The top one is the, you know, the idea of circumstances and not being able to control them. The second one is this idea of my identity and not being able to control that narrative. And the gospel says, okay, I could try to muster up all these things and get it all right, but I probably won't. Rather, it's actually Christ who's done everything right on my behalf. He's still living. He's resurrected. And it's his power that works within me to actually live in a way that glorifies him. So this difference between religion and the gospel. And I didn't include this verse in there, but if you have a Bible, you can see it. Verse 3, actually. Chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 3 says, If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. And that's, that's part of the gospel, actually, is having this experience that you've actually tasted and seen that God is good and real. A few weeks ago, um, my son and I, we were in the city in Toronto. We went to one of our favorite restaurants, this noodle bowl place. And here we got these massive noodle bowls with, like, just amazing flavors. So we're, like, eating it up, slobbering all over the place. And just the whole time, we're like, oh, this tastes so good. And then like days later, just like a random thought would come in. Oh, that noodle bowl was so good. It just tasted so good. And then even yesterday, I was looking through the pictures on my phone for something else. And I saw the picture of the noodle bowl and I was like, oh, the noodle bowl. So good. <laughs> Taste and see, right? That's what Peter is talking about. That kind of experience and feeling of the reality of the gospel in maybe in moments of joy, or maybe even, as Harold was saying, in after this moment of pain where the reality of the gospel comes in, Peter's saying, that taste, that experience of gospel reality, of the living Savior, is what you need to anchor your life on as a believer. Not in what you can do for God, but in what he's done for you. So Peter says, this living person, Jesus Christ, is the cornerstone of, but he goes on, the effect of this, this reality of Christ for the church, for local believers, goes further than that. He goes on in verse 9 then to talk about this new entity that is forming. It says this, but you are a chosen race, a royal priest, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Peter says, he gives a bunch of descriptions there, but essentially he's saying, listen, you are a people now. You are a new people gathered together who are called God's people. Now that is collectively, like around the world, we are God's people, the universal church, but we're also the local church gathered together. This is a new thing being brought together. So like tomorrow I'm officiating a wedding, and a wedding is great, right? You, you see these this man and this woman, this couple coming together, and it's like the beginning of, of a new entity, right? It's like a tiny little people that's starting, a new family coming together. But that idea actually is meant to exist within the church as well. That here we are, a gathered people together who are now called a people. Now, we haven't dated, okay? We, we haven't, you know, gone steady for a while. We've just kind of found ourselves here, some of us. But yet we are a people called to be, as Peter says here, you know, a people that will proclaim the excellencies of him. And so one of the aspects, there's a lot of aspects to that, but one of the aspects that we talk about a lot is this idea of being family, of being a church that is actually family. And the beauty of family is that we are a intergenerational group of people together. So we've chosen to value that aspect of the family idea. So you've got mothers and fathers, you've got siblings, brothers and sisters, you've got grandparents, you've got the uncles, and you've got the whole deal in there that's in the family, okay? And now within the church here, we've specifically said that we actually want to choose to 
to practice that kind of a family mentality as we're called a people together, which we call Citizens Church. And so rather than um, parsing off into uh, groupings, you know, maybe people that are like me, you got these different affinity groups. So, you know, we've got the retired couples that just kind of get together, or we've got like the newlyweds that just get together, or we've got like the singles that get together, or the teens, whatever category you are, maybe you've got like the two kid category, whatever category it is, there's value in like learning from each other, but we're saying as a church that we want to be a people together, a family together on mission. And even though that intergenerationalness, is that a word, um, comes with its own um, difficulties and challenges because we're not all the same. And we may, maybe like one person like rubs you the wrong way and then boom, they're like in your missional family. And you're like, mm, how can I switch out of this one? Um, that actually, when that happens, that's actually to our benefit. When we sit around the table with people who don't see the world exactly like us, it's actually to our benefit. It, it shapes us. Because the other image that we're given in Scripture is of the body, right? Of like fingers and hands and, and noses and ears and knees. And they're not all the same. There might be two of them, right? There might be two elbows. But then there's like a lot of other parts. And the reason that the Apostle Paul uses that image is because he says every part is needed. You need every part, just like I need every part. So we're saying together, as we band together as this intergenerational family, we want to like remind ourselves that that's actually to our benefit, to come together, to have the ages together, to have the varied experiences together, and that will actually bring us together as a chosen people, as a small people. Now, one of the means that we practice that, which we're actually going to be able to do today for the first time is actually over the table, right? Is over food. We've talked about that a lot. There's something about getting together with God's people and even beyond God's people. There's something about the interaction that happens at the dinner table or the lunch table or the snack table, whatever it is, around food. Now I've done a, a bunch of reading on, on, on different topics and one of the topics that um, just fascinates me is the idea of how values and beliefs are transferred from one generation to the next. And so I've done a lot of reading on that, and the, and the Bible talks actually a lot about that. But it's, it's really good when you see actually people who are not Christians writing about things that you see in Scripture. So I've recently read a book called The Boy Crisis, and another book called Handing Down the Faith. And these are like sociologists, and they've done studies. And one of the things that both of those books kind of pulled as like a theme was that the, the best place to transfer beliefs, values, is actually at the dinner table. Is with friends, or specifically they're talking about with um, families, is actually taking time, uh, daily, they actually say, to at least one time sit around the table and eat food and talk about uh, things in life that are a little bit more deeper than just like the weather, right? Going like a little bit further. And so the interesting fact of, in both of the studies was that not only is that influential from the parents' perspective, but it's also from other people that are at the table and even to other generations, you know, such as grandparents and stuff, Okay. And they also noted, both of them noted, the important place that actually fathers have at the table. All right, so just a word to all of us dads out there. It's interesting that both of them, not believers, but from their study, th what they've found is that involved fathers at the table make a marked difference on the transfer of beliefs and values from one generation to the next. So... All, it, all it's doing, people, is confirming what the Word of God has said for thousands of years. Okay, that's all that that does. And one of the key texts that I am often go, go back to is Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, says this. This is a word to Israel, but it's also a word to us. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart you shall teach them diligently to your children and shall 
talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. Basically, it's saying, man, when you're living life together, that's when you should talk about these things and it should come up and around, it doesn't specifically say the dinner table, but it's one of those times, right, when you're around the dinner table and you're talking. And so we see the value on the nuclear family, but there's also great value in the larger family. For us, that's missional families where we gather together and starting to eat food together, but also just enjoy those conversations that take us to deeper levels where values and beliefs are talked about and kind of shown on display. But it's also a place where we can invite others, invite neighbors into, and man, doesn't it just make conversation easier even? Just to have like a cup of coffee with you or to have a piece of pie. I mean, who doesn't like a piece of pie? Come on. Um, And just to bring that in and to actually use that as a gift from God to talk about the things of God. So we are marked as a people, okay? Peter goes on in verse 10. He says this, Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Peter here talks about this difference that has happened in their life. And, and for them to um, recognize it and to enter into it and to keep, keep kind of moving in it. So he says, man, there was a day where you were not believers. You hadn't entered into, you know, understanding what the mercies of God were and what God has done for you through the gospel and through Jesus Christ. But he says, but now you have. Now you have. And he says, keep going with that. In verses 1 through 3 of chapter 2, the beginning there, he says this, So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and slander, like newborn infants long for pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation. So he says, man, you, the way that you're going to grow actually in your spiritual walk is to be fed from God. To like grow and step into that. Here he talks about this, you know, this milk and in other places the Apostle Paul talks about meat. He's talking about this idea of being nourished and being fed and being formed into the image of Christ. If you're a Catholic background, you might, you know, think of like catechism or Maybe like nowadays kind of this spiritual formation is kind of a a buzzword or maybe you're used to the word Bible study or personal devotions. Whatever it is, there have been ways that all of us have grown in our faith, slowly taken little baby steps to form our hearts and our thinking into the person of Christ. And I don't know about you, but this last 18 months has changed my habits of life. It's it's happened to all of us, right? That in some ways, the habits of our life have changed. Whether it's like the timing of our day, you know, whether we start or finish at different times, or there's been more distractions because more kids are around. Maybe you used to have like a really good routine of, of Bible study or of prayer, and then that was gone when COVID came. Or maybe for you, it was even like coming on a Sunday morning and it was just like worshiping and singing and now it's like you've got this little like humidifier in front of you, right? That it's like you don't want to sing at all because you're going to just be dripping in a a minute. And so that actually like, just a, a thing like that has ruined some of your habit of formation, of being formed into the person of Christ. And so in this season And I strongly believe that for all of us, this season of kind of living with COVID, whatever that world's going to look like for the next little while, it's going to be an opportunity for us to reset habits that have maybe changed or have disappeared, or maybe we're never there to begin with, but hopefully now it's a, a new longing for all of us. And so a new rhythm to being formed into the person of Christ is going to come into our lives. And so when I thought of church planting, honestly, that was not the first thing that came into my mind, that that would be what we would enter into. Like a season of disorientation, 
and now coming out of that season into some sort of season of formation. But as I was reading back through one of my church planting books this week, I happened across this um, text that just felt so relevant for us this, in this season. J.R. Woodward says this, We've noticed, when he's talking about church plants, he says, We've noticed that God tends to do less than we expected in the first three years and more than we expect over 10 to 15 years. Often it is in the first three to five years that he has to do more in us so that we are better prepared for what he does through us. Is God using this season to prepare our inner lives? Which is often much more difficult and less satisfying, you know, than seeing some outward things happen. Because the inner life is so difficult to kind of look at. That's why most of us really struggle with like some moments of silence and solitude, taking like 20 minutes, 30 minutes to just sit and listen to the Lord, just sit and like reflect on a psalm or what God has to say to us because what comes up within us probably is like the inner darkness that most people don't see, but that the gospel has addressed, right? The gospel has actually addressed that. It's covered that, but it comes up like a roaring lion And so then we're just like, man, shut the door on the inner life. Let's just keep moving with work or let's just do something else. And here, Woodward is, I think, rightly reminding us that the work that God is actually going to do is actually inner work, and maybe firstly in our case, inner work, to bring us back to the person of Christ, to make him center of anything that we do. And then, Lord willing, we've been asking him, God, would you then use us to do some things in this community where new people would come to Christ, new people would come to faith. There's no baptismal here, but hopefully do some baptisms on the stage or on the floor here, right? Where people come to see Christ, but not because we've just like done stuff, but because God has actually started by doing something in our own hearts. He's actually convinced us again of the gospel reality. So we are leaning into and holding on to this inner work. So then all that, okay, all that then Peter is leading us here to verses 11 and 12. Verses 11 and 12, we'll end with this. He says this, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. So Peter is using these verses, using this section to remind them of the vision of mission. This mission that God has called all of us to and specifically them to. And he's saying don't let the, the sin of the world, the sin of our personal lives, the, the corporate sin that may even w- exist within us. He's saying don't let that pull you away and drag you aside from the mission that God has for you. I think these verses are really an echo of what Christ said in Matthew 5.16 where he said, Let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. That's what Jesus said. So in our, in our workplaces, the, the vocation that we have, whether that's online still, or whether that's with people, or whether that's interacting with other customers, how is it that we are reflecting, we are, as Jesus said, this light shining before men, this example of a Christ follower. How in our communities, with the people that we are interacting with, maybe our neighbors, or maybe the friends that God has allowed us to get to know and be a part of, how is it that God is actually using us to be a light and an example to them? Now what comes to my mind is the reality of sacrifice that is necessary to do that well. The sacrifice that Christ exemplified with his own life of of giving up everything, sacrificing everything so that ultimately he would go to the cross and die. That's where his sacrifice led to. 
And for us, our sacrifice is going to look different. My mind often goes to like when we were missionaries, you know, we went to Africa. Uh, Liz and I went and we only had one kid at the time. Little Maria was a baby. And, you know, we went over and we had to spend all kinds of money to get over there to Africa. And we had to like change the way that we, we dressed to be kind of fitting into the culture. We had to, you know, take malaria medicine if we had malaria. We had to get all kinds of yellow fever shots. Whatever it is that we had to do to get over there. But it made sense, right? We're like, we're a missionary. That's what we got to do. But that kind of missionary mindset, though, though we're not being sent over across a border or to a new place, that kind of missionary mindset of sacrifice and willingness to do things for the sake of someone else, for the sake of someone who doesn't know Christ, is the mindset that we need. The willingness to let go of personal preferences. The willingness to sit at the table with people who may not disagree, may not agree with us. They may disagree with us, right? The willingness to do that, that personal sacrifice. Because here's what Peter says. He says, when you live that way, when you live like a a missionary mindset, you're on mission, you're serving, what's probably going to happen is, he says there, that people are going to reject you, right? Right? Verse 12 says, Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers. So this is probably what would have happened in the first century. People would have found out that you're a Christian and and some of the things that would have come into their mind would have been, wow, you only believe in one God? We live in a world of like all kinds of gods. We live in a world where we can go to the temple and worship gods. Where Caesar is a God, you only believe in one God? Or maybe they would have said, you only believe that, you know, sex belongs between a husband and a wife in marriage? Are you crazy? First century life, man, you can go to the temple prostitutes, you can sleep with your slaves. I mean, come on, there's total sexual freedom. And now you're saying this is all that you believe in? Or maybe they would say, you believe that all people have been made in God's image? What? You mean like you and your slave and, and that woman, your wife over there, you're all created equally in God's image? Is that what you believe in? That's the kind of mindset that the first century Greco-Roman world would have viewed some of the thoughts of Christianity. And is it so different from our world today? It's not, actually. Sometimes we look at the texture and we're like, oh man, that was like thousands of years ago. Our world is so much more sophisticated than that. The same things could be set of Christians today, right? You only believe that Jesus is the only way? You really, you believe that? You still believe that sex is only between a husband and a wife in the context of marriage? You're still living in that antiquated world? You're actually not on the side of like all this tribalism that's happening in this world, this division between, you know, the haves and the have-nots. You actually believe that everybody is created in God's image? This is the same line that's been repeated over and over and over again. And Peter says, listen, when that happens, here's what should also happen at the same time. In that moment, when the neighbor or when the coworker hears that you're a Christian, all those thoughts might just like bump around in their head and they're like, oh, really? But then at the same time, they might think, wow, I really like working with them though. They're like, really like a kind coworker. I actually really feel safe around them. That's my neighbor. He's, he's that, but I feel like I could like sit around the dinner table with them, and we've done it multiple times. And so within them, there's this internal conflict of like, this is what I disagree with and struggle with, and yet at the same time, I'm drawn to them. And so Peter says, this is what people should be left with. They might not agree with everything that you stand for, obviously because they're not Christians, but at the same time, they've been drawn in by the love of Christ as it's been modeled and lived out on mission before them. So, the vision of citizens is nothing new. It's very much words that we've just read from a couple thousand years ago. 
And the vision of citizens is not perfect. You might be sitting here and you might be thinking maybe a couple things as I was thinking about it this week. You might be thinking on one hand, you're like, wow, these guys sound naive and idealistic. When is the service over so that I can get the potluck and hit the road? Okay, that might be you. Or maybe you're thinking on the other side, you're like, this is perfect. I love this. This is the vision that everybody in Elmira needs to hear and have and hold. And I'd say that probably both those are wrong, okay? We're just like a people that are caught by a vision that we've seen. And I think Eugene Peterson put it well. He put it this way. On close examination, it turns out there are no wonderful congregations. Hang around long enough, and sure enough, there are those gossips who won't shut up. Furnaces that malfunction, or in our case, a boiler that malfunction. Sermons that misfire. Disciples who quit, or even worse. Every congregation is a congregation of sinners. As if that weren't enough, they, are all, they all have sinners for pastors. We are called as Citizens Church to be faithful to the vision that God has given to us. It is not a perfect vision. We are not a perfect congregation. But we want to be committed to the grace and the goodness and the, the glory of Jesus Christ together. That's why we want to be gospel-centered we want to be family oriented. We want to be formed by Jesus and we want to be on mission together. So, if you are new to the vision here or if you have been here a while, I'll just ask for one point of application for you. And that is to join a missional family. That's really the only thing that we ask of people is to join a missional family. And if you're in a missional family already, join that missional family. And what I'm saying is, Enter into the vision of Citizens Church. Don't just be a part of something. Enter into the vision of it because, man, all we're doing is asking that God would be gracious to us and use us to accomplish his mission here in Elmira, that Jesus would be glorified. Amen? That's all we're doing. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for these words uh, from Peter, and thank you, Lord, that they challenge us and they... Um, remind us again of, of your mission and of the work of Christ in all of our hearts. And Lord, that's, that's really all we lean on. And uh, we pray that you're glorified by what we do um, each and every week here uh, together as a church family. In Jesus' name, amen.